welcome to Dead Man Token. Tonight's story is an exclusive werewolf or dogman camping horror story that I'm sure you can all sink your teeth into from the incredible mind of James Mitchell. As ever though, please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. Well, it really does help build the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. And so, with that aside, let's get into tonight's story. Entitled Creek in the Woods. Let's get straight into that. Life is one part irony, one part coincidence, and a fair share of providence. This is the story of how I found purpose in my life. The Lord giveth, and he taketh away. We're all familiar with that sentiment, but few of us experience it as profoundly as I once did. I was lucky enough in my youth to think I had found my true calling as a martial arts instructor and survivalist. After a decade and a half, that was taken away from me by my own lack of judgment and faith in the good of people. Five years and three surgeries later, I was able to walk once again without a cane. My wife stood by me the whole time, but I could see the difference in the way that she looked at me. And for those years, I felt every day like I was losing the fight until we found a good orthopedic surgeon by the grace of God. After surgery, my leg could bear my weight and I could walk unaided, but I still can't to this day run or really teach martial arts. The realization had set in that that part of my life, well, I was over. It was at that point in my life that I decided I had to rediscover who I was. Of course, I thought, the best way to do it was to go to the woods and find out if I still had the ability to survive on my own in an environment that was one point in my life a refuge from the day-to-day -day grind. I planned a trip that would be at one time a cakewalk, but my current condition made me apprehensive. Four days and three nights solo in the mountains of Colorado. I had grown up in Indiana. I had spent as much time in the Hoosier National Forest as many of the game wardens had. This, however, was a new place I had no experience with. That part <laughs> honestly excited me. This trip to the mountains was like preparing for a prize fight, scary and exciting. And as the day got closer, I must have checked my gear three times a day, putting my backpack on and walk in the neighborhood to get used to the weight again. And my wife and kids dropped me at the park with my gear, and we ate lunch together before they left. My wife gave me a new piece of gear, a camp shovel from the internet that she had said might help with the terrain. The shovel's handle expanded to a size made it more of a walking stick than a camp shovel. And to be honest, it hurt my feelings, but I could see she was just trying to make it a little easier on my knee. And as I watched my family leave, a feeling of anxiety swelled in me, like nothing I'd felt before, not even during my black belt examination, did I feel like this. And as I looked down the trail, Leading into the forest, I centered my thoughts on the task ahead, telling myself that this was literally a walk in the park. A few deep breaths later, I swung my pack into position and took up my new top-heavy walking stick. It was a little unwieldy at first, but after the quarter mile or so, I was starting to get used to it. And the trail I was on would lead to a creek, according to the topo map about two and a half or so miles in. That was where I would set up camp if I could find a suitable spot. And, although a couple of miles doesn't sound like much, it truly was for me. About an hour into my trek, I stopped to take a breather and checked the map, and I had kind of figured that I had barely made it halfway. But granted, I was in no real hurry. I was trying to take in the feel of nature around me. As I sat there, on a rock surrounded by green, it all felt off somehow. I shut it up to my own unfamiliarity with the area convinced myself a night under the stars and a campfire would set me right. And so, I pressed on. As I got closer to my planned camp spot, I could hear the creek and smell the cool water. And it was the first time during this outing that I felt secure. My planned spot wasn't a spot as much of an area that looked close to, but off the trail as the trail turned away from the creek. I left the trail as it paralleled the creek, I was looking for a place along the bank that would let me be close to the water and have enough cover to construct a shelter. Not long after I had left the trail, I found a bend in the creek where a tree had fallen over 
and left the roots exposed. At the top of the roots were about six and a half feet off the ground, and had left a nice spot to set up a shop, so to speak. And the spot was breathtakingly beautiful, and after setting the tarp up in a root system, like an awning, using the close by branches of the tree that was still standing next to it, I set about settling in. I collected rocks for a fire in, collected grass to line the bottom of my shelter, and I set up a fish run with sticks from and down the tree. Not really because I had to, more just to see if I still could, and a nice pan fish wouldn't hurt my feelings. After pulling up a rock to the fire for a stool, and with a few minor touches, my camp was set. Sitting there on the creek bank, watching my fire and listening to the sounds of the creek in the background, was amazing. The sense of accomplishment I had was, was undescribable. After a while, I got up and cleaned up the dinner mess as I went to a tree at the edge of the clearing before bed. That was when I realised how quiet the woods were. I feeling very exposed all of a sudden, I tried to look into the dark, letting my eyes adjust as much as possible. A long moment later, I backed slowly into the light of my fire, convincing myself that it was just nerves because of my leg and my subconscious fear and my own infirmity. I got close to the roots of my shelter and lit up a bowl of weed to relieve the stress and pain in my knee. And having gotten a little greedy on the pipe, I coughed my head off when I heard a branch break behind me. Putting the bowl down, I stood up and moved to look around the roots, trying to be discreet and see if I could catch a glimpse of what made the twig break. Although I couldn't see anything, I heard something hauling ass away from me. And laughing at myself and what I assumed was a deer, I got comfortable and stoked the fire before trying to get some sleep. I wish I could say I slept like a baby, but I was up all night, on and off, keeping the fire stoked. I definitely should have added more padding to my shelter in the morning if I wanted to get some more rest. And the next day was fairly calm and relaxing, as I had intended. The fish run caught breakfast for me. The coffee was great as usual. I made the improvements to the shelter and put myself at ease and started cloverleaf in the area around my camp. Now the scenery was awesome in the early afternoon sun, and I was feeling more confident about my abilities at the spot I had chosen. That's when the whole trip flipped on me. About 300 yards from my clearing, I found something that chilled me to the core. A gut pile. I saw it a ways off, thank God. Getting off the game trail, I was following. I circled the massive gore. It wasn't even a carcass, really. The animal's head was missing, and some of the bones that I did see were splintered in ways I had never seen before. There were no drag marks away from the scene that I could see, and the trails leading away from the carnage were weird. I expected a bear. Well, that would be bad enough, I thought. Where I expected bear tracks, I found dog or wolf prints. But the difference in what I expected and what I was seeing threw me off for a minute. But calming myself, I took a closer look at the evidence that was before me. Now, wolves wouldn't worry me normally, especially knowing that they had full bellies. But I couldn't shake this weird feeling. Or was it just my mind playing tricks on myself with my own infirmity? and the lack of confidence affected my mentality that much. And the tracks led away from my clearing and towards the deep bush. I didn't want to disturb the kill site, but I wanted to make more sense of what I was seeing, and thinking maybe that a bear had run the wolves off, or that a quick and quiet fight was over to kill, might have taken place. I looked around and saw no sign of a struggle over the carcass, and confused I decided that, well, animals do what animals do. I went back to the clearing, and made sure that I had enough firewood for a large fire all night, thinking that would be all I needed to keep any wild animals wary. And I would like to say that I didn't give it a second thought, but with my new walking stick slash camp shovel, I dug a few holes and punky stick them with small stakes, trying to convince myself I was just practicing defensive survival skills. And so eventually I rigged up a few trip lines too, and as evening set in, I had convinced myself everything was normal when I had set up a nice perimeter, if not. And a view was amazing from my shelter, facing towards sunset, with nothing obscure in the forest and the sky from where I had dug my stump of a chair. The day's strangeness all but forgotten, and I prepared and ate dinner, stoked the fire back up, and smoked my evening pipe. When I a puffs later, I heard something in the trees. I feel like I should say that 
A survival instructor once told me that, at night in the woods alone, a mouse sounds like a squirrel. A squirrel sounds like a raccoon. A raccoon sounds like a bear. And a bear sounds like Bigfoot. Hearing noises in the woods is a fact of life, but this put me on edge. I had rigged my shelter in between an uprooted tree and the one it had fallen against. I had strung the tarp to make an overhang, and back from the base of the uprooted tree to the lower branches of the one that was still standing. I couldn't see into the woods from where I sat, and was purposely trying to ignore the silence, other than the occasional snap of a twig or rustle of a moving brush. Just as I was about to give in to my curiosity and take a look, I heard a heavy thud, followed by the sound of an animal in pain. It was what came next to paralyze me for the first time ever. I felt like I was in real danger. At once, it seemed the woods around the clearing came alive with yelps and calls. I couldn't figure how many there were, but I was more than three. But it was what came next that absolutely changed my life. A howl so powerful that it stirred something primal in me. A mix of terror and indignation. I grabbed my pack and was about to stand up and haul ass when it hit me how stupid that truly would have been. I pictured myself trying to run from a pack of wolves, at least four, and quite possibly more strong, my busted knee making me look like a lame animal. If I could bear the pain, even a fit man has no chance of outrunning a pack of any canines. In that moment, I realised everything. It was an indescribable moment, a moment of understanding that hit me hard. The sounds were retreating as fast as the echoes of the howl did. I let go of my pack and listened for what the night would tell. The sounds were gone, but were they really gone? Well, it was quiet. The sun had only been down for about two hours. It was just full dark when it started. Nights of repelling wolves and early morning of hiking out seemed like my immediate future. But something was telling me it was more than that. That howl. It was off somehow. And it snapped something inside of me. I knew what I would look like to a pack of predators if I fled. I was calm in a way that I can't really explain. I put my headlamp on and took out my walking stick, the black camp expandable shovel, and strapped my hatchet and knife back onto my belt. I grabbed the branch from the fire and went to make sure that they had at least retreated to the tree line. My fire provided no light on that side of the roots, and so I slowly peeked out from my suddenly very flimsy shelter and started scanning the trees for eyeshine or movement. Not seeing anything, I started to glance at the ground, looking to see if it had been the pit or the tripwire that caused the wolf to fall, and why it seemed so heavy. Why it had been the pit that had caused it to fall at the edge of the clearing. The pit was shallow, and the slender stakes were intended for a bear or something to step in, and being on four legs, not overly hurt, if they felt the stakes and stopped moving and pulled back. I hadn't set the stakes in deeply, or in any way to be sturdy. They were just meant as deterrents, and if any weight was really put on them, the stakes being nothing more than green twigs about six inches long, and just pushed in enough to stay upright in the bottom of the hole. And when I got closer to the now exposed hole, what I found was blood on the sticks, and on the log about two and a half more, no, more than three feet away. It had blood and four clawed marks on it, like it had tried to catch itself. And as I examined the spot that I thought it had fell, and the hole, the side it looked like it had tripped on something, because the side was slightly caved in, and it was a bloody paw print beside the hole. The track led into the woods, but the track was a paw print, as if it was limping on it. It didn't make sense. A wolf would have been putting that injured paw down, but this one did, and it was big. And just as I was about to bend down and take a closer look, I got the feeling like I was being watched. I looked into the woods, with my headlamp slowly scanning in the dark, looking for telltale eyeshine of an animal, and after a few seconds it dawned on me how vulnerable I was in the open, and now my hastily chosen torch was nothing more than a stick with embers at the end. And I started to back up towards my shelter, when I caught it in the light. I was standing behind a tree when my light stopped on it, it stepped from behind the tree and stared at me. I froze. When our eyes met, I was seeing what I was seeing. It was about five feet tall. Sandy-colored fur covered its well-fed-looking body. 
It had one arm outstretched to the tree. I noticed its shoulders were rounded, like a person or an ape. Not the slender profile of a dog on its hind legs, using a tree for support. Also, it was standing away from the tree with an outstretched arm. Now, the head was different from a dog or wolf. More broad in the snout than a boxer, but longer than its ears, and they were pointed and alert. Its neck seemed longer than it should be, proportionate to the animal, not as thick as, say, a husky, almost like a racing dog's neck. His eyes stood there, taking in what I was seeing, the arm or front leg that was free from the tree, of the paw towards me. The shoulders may have been more rounded, but the range of motion was apparent. In that instant, I was back at the martial arts school, looking for any advantage that I could find in my opponent. I honestly was just waiting for it to move. I wanted to see if it would drop to all fours or stride away. Was it awkward or comfortable, an easy gait? Would the thing move its arms differently in stride? And did it have a tail? Would it be able to pivot or angle up close? Where would its sense of balance be? Now be aware of your surroundings. Watch the way your opponent moves. These are things I've preached in all facets of instruction. As I was watching the thing, I realized that it wasn't nervous or even agitated. It was watching me like I was watching it. And that's when it dawned on me. It wanted me to see it. Its head twitched and it looked to my left. I dropped my embered stick and will to see another one break the tree line. The thing barreling towards me upright looked like a linebacker, squaring up to level and running back. I pointed the spade of the shovel at it and yelled. When it stopped short, I heard the other charging. These things are working in tandem. It wasn't me yelling that made it hesitate. They had planned it this way. I closed the distance in what seemed like an instant. I wish I could say I was graceful, evading its rush, but I stumbled off balance and swung the spade upwards as I stepped awkwardly backwards. The momentum of the beast carried it between me and the other one, and my spade found the thing's face. It howled in pain and reached for its face with its pawed hand. And standing in the woods at night, facing two weirdly deformed wolves and having cut the first thing's face from its maw to its ear, which was tattered and split. I couldn't help but think I'm fending off Scooby-Doo and his hillbilly cousin with a shovel. And not knowing what else to do, I yelled, Get out of here! At the top of my lungs, the creature I had gashed took its paw away from its wound and growled. And being literally feet away from these things, it was unreal. The only thing between me and these creatures was an expanding camp shovel and about three steps. Not wanting to seem like prey backing up wasn't an option. I'm not sure why, but I wasn't afraid of them at all. I think that's the reason the two looked at each other, the second one made a whining sound, and then they started walking back towards the trees, like nothing was out of the ordinary at all. Not wanting to be blindsided again, I left the remnants of the stick to smolder where it fell, and keeping my head on a swivel, I scanned the trees for movements or sound, all the way back to my fire. As I stood there, listening to the crackle of the fire and the babble of the stream behind me, my mind was racing, but rational, all things considered. I needed a plan that didn't end in me getting chased down and torn apart. I started taking stock of what I actually had that might be used as weaponry, or what I could ditch to move faster. I had my hatchet and my knife on my belt already. I wish I could say that they were somehow special, but they were a pretty typical camp hatchet and knife combo. The hatchet itself did have a nice sized handle. It was about 18 to 20 inches long. It allowed for a good range of motion. The head was a little light for fighting, but well suited for its purpose. The knife was a buck knife, and against a man with a six inch blade, I will be formidable. In the current situation, not so much. My walking stick slash camp shovel was the least familiar of my gear. I had a metal shaft like a Maglite's flashlight. It was segmented, and the spade did have two fairly well beveled edges, making apparently a more effective weapon than I thought it could. I had been using it for a walking stick and shoving the spade in the ground when I wasn't really using it, particularly not to lose it, and so it would be close to me when I stood up. Either way had it given me much opportunity to inspect it and the butt of the handle had a rubbery cover over it, about halfway to the segment, and then the spade was about at my shoulder. 
walking my weight on it helped me ease the pressure and adjust my weight better on the uneven terrain. It seems like the spade of the shovel was meant to be used as a hatchet of sorts and had a decent edge to it that resembled the way an axe is beveled, but the weight of it made it too awkward to use as a spear, really. Even as I went through my meagre resources, my inner MacGyver came out. I was trying to prepare of something that was completely insane, and in all the training I had done, in all the years of firearm, survival, and martial training, I could have never come up with a more unlikely situation. Hell, I had a student ask me how I would defend against a bazooka, and we actually discussed it. That's when it hit me. I had a plan, and a smirk played across my face. The same feeling I got before a belt promotion, or a class that I knew was going to hurt. I quickly set about organizing my things for a fight. Grabbing my kit, I took out the tin of pepper and the coffee filters. When I was younger, and at a point in my life that was colorful, let's just say we would pour pepper anywhere a drug dog might sniff. I would assume that strategy is self-explanatory for concealing contraband. And so I emptied the tin into a filter, not having a whole lot of pepper left in the tin, and did what I could to make it into a ball and bound it with a bread tie. It was in the back, and it ended up being a little bit bigger than a good-sized cherry tomato. Next, I ripped a pair of socks apart and used the shovel to whack a couple of wrist-sized limbs from the tree that I was using. I wrapped the socks around the limbs and used what I could of the cooking oil to make three decent torches. I didn't know if the two creatures would come back tonight or if they were done for the night. Just as likely, they were gathering together and building up the confidence to try again. I had gathered more than enough firewood for my stay in, having grabbing it pretty much as I had seen it. Call it a quirk, but I always thought it was, and would be cool to find a pile of wood ready for the fire, and kind of a nice way of saying someone else had been here without hurting anything. I set about getting three fires ready to be lit in a white triangular pattern, using the creek as the base, leaving about two white steps between them. I had taken a few tense trips into the open to get the fires ready, but I was ready as I would ever be, so I lit them, starting with the farthest one, first keeping my back to the creek. Now having lit the fires, I walked back to my shelter and put a pot of coffee on the fire and drank some of the cold water I had in the creek cooling. And the woods were quiet and the atmosphere seemed thick, like the whole forest was holding its breath. The coffee was starting to steam and bubble, so I grabbed my walking stick to add some wood to my fires before the coffee was ready. I had built the farthest two fires up and was putting a piece on the outside of the closest fire when a noise in the tree I was using for shelter made me stop and look up. And just as it launched itself out the tree, I almost fell over the fire as I brought the shovel between us. The momentum and sheer weight of this thing forced the butt of the shovel into the ground. And I wanted to lose the shovel, I held on somehow and let it continue over me. And as it hit the ground, the force of the fall pulled me over it. I don't know how, but the spade hadn't went clean through the thing. It was stuck just past the top of the spade. I yanked it free, letting my surprise turn to anger. The thing made a gurgling sound and exhaled its last breath. A sound I can only describe as a roar came from the tree line to my left as an explosion of leaves and fur came at me. It was so quick, all I could do was barely get out of the way. But I drove the shovel deep into the thing as it bent by, ripping it away from me and leaving the creature fallen in a mass at the edge of the creek, wiping out the fire and scattering the burning wood and embers as it fell. Before the thing had even stopped tumbling, I was a step behind it, not wanting to lose the obviously more effective weapon that I had originally given it credit for. During the tumble, the shovel had picked up a warp, but it still looked to be in a workable shape, and thankfully, the fall and roll must have done some work because it came out of the body of that thing far more easily than I had expected. It was when I reached to grab it that I realized that the one from the tree line had got me across the shoulder with its claws. The damn things were so sharp that the cut had just registered. The cuts were deep and they were bleeding good. I could feel the blood running down my back of my shirt. I turned to the tree line with my shovel in hand and saw two more of those things and I felt my gut drop. Walking into the clearing, flanked by one that I had marked was a creature the size of a grizzly bear, and then some, with black fur and the body of the upright wolf. 
As to where, let's call him, Scar and his body, they looked like Scooby-Doo, almost comical. Well, this thing did not. This beast walked deliberately towards me. The stride was measured and not at all awkward looking. As they came into the clearing, what was left of my fires illuminated a creature that was terrifying. Every fibre of my reason told me that this was it, and yet that realisation just made me angry in a way I could only describe as resolve. I walked towards the fire that would have been the middle of my triangle. The beast towered over Scar and was easily twice his girth. I kept the fire behind me about two steps. I could feel its heat on my bloody back. And when the beast reached the middle of the clearing, it stopped and looked at the heap of the one that had got to me. When his lips started quivering and pulled back to reveal exactly what you would expect the teeth of a predator to be. A growl so low rumbled, I could almost feel it. He slowly turned to meet my eyes, and it took all I had to not look away. Their eyes locked, and the beast's eyes were full of menace and intent. And without words I knew, he meant to rip me apart. His growl intensifying. The Scar must have mistook what the beast was going to do, because as Scar moved to advance, past the beast, he grabbed him and pinned Scar to the ground with one motion of his massive claws. The beast couldn't have made it more clear he was going to show me whose territory this was. May he never broke eye contact with me, even as he crouched and growled loudly in Scar's ear. He rose and released Scar in the process, who upon his release sprang up and ran to the tree line and turned to watch the fight that I assume he hoped to just be a bystander. The beast stared at me, Daring me to meet him. This wasn't about territory. Dominance. I squared my shoulders and stood as tall as I could, never breaking the gaze. I took a step towards the beast, and it roared. The one earlier was a mere squeak compared to this. But before he could finish, I tried my best to match it. Now his charge was blindingly fast, and I stepped into his charge with a shovel as he lifted his claw to pin me as he had Scar. I angled and thrust the shovel as hard as I could into the side of his throat, using both our momentum and the force to my advantage, nearly taking his head clean off and catching a claw grasped down my arm as the beast's body in its dying throes tried to carry out its last intent. My left arm and shoulder were but shredded. I swung the shovel over my head with my right and finished removing the beast from his head. I suddenly feeling very dizzy, and every ounce of exertion on top of the adrenaline and blood loss looked to where Scar had been, watching. Instead of the abomination pointing the bloody warp shovel at it, and I screamed at him as I had the beast. He averted his eyes from me, like a dog would, then glanced back, then turned, and walked into the woods. I felt very different from when Scar and his body had left earlier. More final. As the sounds of its retreat faded, I took several deep breaths and yelled into the sky with what strength I could find. I stood there for a moment until the echo died and walked back to my shelter. On the verge of passing out, I was spent. I got out the pantry, see my first aid kit from my bag, and to my great relief, there was a trauma pad in there, and liquid iodine, not to mention a couple of rubber tourniquets. I covered and cleaned what I could reach and made a sling from my clean shirt. I dropped to my knees and thanked God Almighty for guiding my body and blessing me with the best wife in creation, for it was her that packed this particular first aid kit and who insisted on the shovel and allowed me to take this trip, and my children for giving me the resolve to stay strong, facing the beast. I sit next to my fire, I got that cup of coffee and forced myself to eat, and I laughed out loud and said, you ain't out of the woods yet. And the rest of the night was quiet after that cup of coffee. The normal sounds of the woods returned to the night. It made me feel more secure. Other than that, I stayed awake until dawn, organising what gear I had left and my thoughts. And the truth of the matter was that the other fires had long burned out and I wasn't going to meet my wife until tomorrow at the parking lot. And there was at least two more of those things out there. Scar, and the one that had fallen into the pit. 
I figured if I timed it right, I could get to the parking lot before dark and leave a message here. I let the sun get all the way up and the sky was bright blue before I set about getting ready for the withdrawal. And as I looked over the carnage of the night before, I was understanding more and more about what these creatures were and what last night had meant. The thing that had leapt from the tree was a male. From its teeth and size, I would guess he wasn't full grown. Most likely the beast's pup, judging by his reaction when he saw him. And it was a he with black fur like the beast's. Not as long, he had a patch of white on the chest and arm. The one on the creek bank was female and mature. Her teeth were all well worn. And she was the one that had come with Scar. Her fur was much shorter than the beast and his pup, and her coat was a dusty brown. Her body was much slimmer than even the pup's. Her ears drooped, and she was nearly as long as the young one, but much lighter. And where her shoulders met, her neck was more narrow, as if she could have just easily run on all fours if she wanted. And the beast was an enigma all on his own. It was like his whole body was just a mixed-up bag of bear and wolf and gorilla. He was heavier than he looked, and he looked heavy. His claws were razor sharp, like his pops, and with a slight curve. I turned his body on its side and dragged the other two over to it. I found a sapling about as wide as my leg at the knee and cut it down. And after sharpening both ends, I drove it into the ground and piled some rocks around the base, and then the bodies, and slammed the beast's head onto my makeshift pike. After choking down a dehydrated meal and some more coffee, I drank a lot of water and waited. I drank as much water as I could and then peed all over the corpses of those things and filled my canteen upstream of where the female had ended up and tucked my tarp under the fallen tree. It might not seem like a lot, but one armed this was all quite tricky and took more time. Now, having finished the message, I tied the torches to my pack and started towards the parking lot just past midday. My warp shovel in hand and pepper ball in the sling. My pace was much quicker on the exit than coming in and once I reached the remnants of the park's path, I stopped and rested for a minute. I was beyond exhaustion. Now the cliché is my whole body hurts. I was living that and I knew that if I waited longer I would just be harder to get moving. When suddenly I realised how quiet it was. I grabbed my shovel, I was moving down the path again with purpose. Had they found my message? Were they already coming? No rest for the weary, I thought. That was all a reminder that I needed to stay alert. And the shadows were getting long when I saw the lot ahead of me on the trail, and a feeling of a marathon runner has seeing the finish line and finding a reserve to kick back to the finish is the only way that I can describe how I felt. I get into the lot, I built a fire in the cemented in grill and set my kettle to boil with water that I had left, just enough for dinner in a bag and a coffee that I desperately needed at this point. And as the water did its thing, I gathered all the wood I could find around the lot without going far into the tree line and built a bonfire right in the middle of the parking lot. Whilst eating and getting a cup of coffee in me, I spent the night watching and moving around to stay awake. When well after midnight, a howl came from the direction of my shelter. I was far enough away that I could tell how many there were, but it was more than one, and I was, after all, miles from the site. I drank coffee and paste for hours until the sun had started to rise, but it didn't make me feel any better. They had either decided to call off the hunt, or they were coming now. And with every moment that passed, my family was getting closer and closer. By mid-morning, I was almost in a panic inside, trying to look calm, but lack of sleep and trauma weighing heavy on my faculties. When I heard a car in the distance, I moved to the entrance of the parking lot, and it was my wife. Well, instead of relief, I was afraid for the first time in this entire encounter. I didn't even let her pull into the lot. And as she pulled up, I yelled to stay in the car and pop the trunk. And she did exactly what I asked. I threw my pack and shovel into the trunk and looked up at the other end of the lot. And there was Scar, standing at the footpath into those woods. He was glaring at me like the beast had, when my wife must have seen him, and she screamed. I snapped back to myself, and I yelled over to her to stay calm, and I walked to the passenger side door. 
and as I grabbed the handle, Scar threw his head back and howled. And this time I heard it, echoed by more than just one. It seemed like the whole woods erupted in howls. I got in my car. My wife hadn't taken her eyes off the thing, and my kids were in quite a hysteric state. My youngest was crying, and the elder two were plastered to the windows of the car. And as soon as I hit the seat, my wife was hidden in the gas. I think the car taken off actually shut the door. I tried to answer her questions and tell her that I was all right, but as soon as we cleared the forest, I passed out. I woke up some time later in hospital, with my pepper ball on the table next to me and my wife in a chair in the corner. And after giving her the best explanation I could, and a day in the hospital, I went home with what was bound to be some righteous scars and a story I could only share with my wife. And of course, as a scary story for my kids. I really wish I could say that everything went back to normal and that it was over here. But a month after my trip, my oldest was getting laundry from the line just after sunset, when she said that she felt like she was being watched. And as she was putting her last few items in the basket, she saw him just inside the tree line. Now her scream brought me out just in time to see him walk into the shadows. And like I said, that's when I found my purpose. Ah, into the woods we go. Wow, 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 wow. Certainly another one. Wow. What a chest pound and a truly creepy story there. And from the incredible mind of James Mitchell. Executed with absolute pure creepiness. And I really hope you enjoyed my rendition. And will certainly keep an eye out for more of your work in the future. Well, guys and girls as ever, you know the drill. Please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. It really does help build the channel and that community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. Now if you think you can pen the next big hit or just want to have a crack of things, then please do get in touch with me at the contact email, which is as on screen. Contact the dead one at gmail.com. I really look forward to hearing from you. As ever, guys and girls, I hope you're all well and happy, family and friends alike, and you're trying to keep fit and focused. But above all, remember, be safe, not sorry. I sit next to my fire. I've got a cup. Fuck you. Her coat was a dusty brown. Her body was much slimmer than even the pups. Her body was much slimmer than even. Her body was even. Oh, God. I went back to the clearing and made sure that I had enough firewood for a large fire all night, thinking that would be all I needed to keep the animal. To keep any. To keep any wild animals wary. This first trip to the mountains was like preparing for a fur. For, 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 forest of fear. For, 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 forest of fear.